Hi, this is Joe Feeks, editor of Poultry Health Today, and with me is Dr. Daryl Jackwood. He's a professor at The Ohio State University. Good to see you, Daryl. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, you have a, been giving a poster at the AAAP meeting, uh, and it's on mutations and antigenic drift. And I think most of our viewers understand the concept of virus mutations, but to get everybody on the same page, could you give us a layman's description of antigenic drift? So antigenic drift basically is the virus changing through mutations so that no, the antibodies that were binding to the parent virus no longer bind to the mutated virus. So the drift is occurring as these amino acids change slowly over time, and that's why it's called a drift, as, a ver as opposed to something called a shift. An antigenic shift is where you get a big change all of a sudden, and that's usually when the, the genomes reassort or something like that. Well, with Bursal disease virus, the genome can reassort, but the part of the virus that actually controls antigenicity is mutating slowly over time, and so the antigenicity of the virus is drifting as those amino acids change. And if you get enough change, enough drift, now you've got a virus that doesn't respond or that can break through the immunity that you're getting through the, you know, the ancestor viruses or the ones that were, the vaccines were made to. Mm -hmm. So how big a problem is this? Is this something that you only see in a few flocks or is it quite common? It's quite common actually for bursal disease. We see this as the major way this virus changes antigenically. It has a couple other mechanisms that it can use, but this is the primary one. And there appears to be just a couple of amino acids that are changing that can really control antigenicity of this virus because of the structure of its surface protein. And we know where most of those are. I'm sure there's a couple that we don't, but we know where most of those are. And so we, we can follow those through time and see how the viruses are changing. And as we get more and more of these amino acids change, then we get quite concerned about these viruses breaking through maternal immunity, particularly in, in bursal disease. And are there any particular types of operations where you would expect to see more mutations and antigenic drift than in other types of operations? Not really. I mean, mutations are random. So mutations happen all the time. It's a double-stranded RNA virus. It's going to mutate. The selection pressure is really what, what leads to the actual amino acid change that is then kept. So these viruses will change an amino acid through mutation, but that, may, that change may not give it an advantage in the environment. And so those, those populations die out. But when a change occurs, it gives a virus an advantage. It can replicate faster, it can transmit easier, it can out-replicate its ancestors. Those changes are kept, and those populations tend to expand. And so all poultry operations have some sort of, Im of uh, immunity or vaccination that they're doing for infectious personal disease virus. And that immunologic pressure that's put on the virus is what's selecting for these mutations. So how has a virus changed in the United States over, say, the last five years? Yeah, so the last five years, primarily in the United States, what we see is the variant viruses. So what they call the variants, and, and uh, I'd like to make a, a comment about <laughs> the terms that they use on these viruses mm -hmm. here in a minute, but um, what's happening in the last five years is the variants are changing. So they're drifting antigenically so that the variant viruses that we had 20 years ago that the vaccines were made from are no longer working against the variant viruses that we see today because the variant viruses we see today have drifted enough, drifted far enough away from the, the, the variant vaccines that are out there in the market that they're no longer protecting. Uh, and so consequently, lots of, of farms have gone to making autogenous vaccines uh, against the field viruses that they're seeing today. So, but it, you were comparing it to like vaccines that were maybe used 20 years ago. Uh, has the commercial vaccine industry been keeping up with this? No, unfortunately not. In fact, 20 years is probably generous for the commercial poultry vaccines because I think most of the variants that we have, variant vaccines that we have today were made in the 1980s mm -hmm. when those viruses first started coming out. Uh, so that's quite a long time ago, and because of the, the cost and the, uh, all the regulatory issues around creating another vaccine, 
uh, vaccine companies just have been reluctant to do that. So we really don't have a good commercial vaccine for the viruses that we're seeing in the field right now in the U.S. So as a result of this, are we seeing lots of IBD outbreaks or is it just some clinical IBD? What, what are we seeing in the field if this virus keeps changing and if the vaccinations are not in sync with it? Sure. So in the field, it's a subclinical disease. So it's very, very difficult to diagnose just by looking at a flock. Performance issues is what we will typically see. Uh, slower growth, uneven flocks, uh, poor feed conversions. Uh, so those kinds of things can be caused by a lot of different things, uh, management and other diseases, but bursal disease virus will also do that. Um, primarily what the uh, producer is seeing now in the broiler farms is that these variants are breaking through their maternal immunity. And if they do that prior to two weeks of age, they're getting a permanent immune suppression in these birds. And so then opportunistic pathogens like E. coli or even a vaccine strain of say bronchitis can now start causing problems in these flocks because they're immune suppressed. Mm -hmm. If the maternal immunity can get them past that two week mark in their age, then when they get bursal disease, and they're going to, because eventually the maternal antibodies are going to drop off, when they get bursal disease at that point, they do still get immune suppression, but it's transient. So it goes away eventually as the birds recover. But during that period when they're in the infection and they have this transient immune suppression, they're vulnerable to everything, I mean, that, that might come into that farm or that might already be there. Uh, and so we'll see lots of secondary infections. Gangrenous dermatitis is one that's really often seen with immune suppressed birds. And so when you start to see those kinds of things, you, you can't just treat what you're seeing in the symptoms. You gotta go back and look and see, are we getting immune suppression in, in these birds? Because that's what these pathogens shouldn't be causing a problem unless we have immune suppression. And are these variants, are they going to be more of a problem, let's say in a, an antibiotic free or reduced antibiotic? environment? Yeah. Sure they are because uh, when we had antibiotics as a tool to use, if these birds became immune suppressed, primarily the secondary infections they get are bacterial. Mm -hmm. And so lots of farms would just rely on antibiotics to get the, these birds through till they get to market. So they'll treat the bacterial infections with antibiotics, the birds recover, they can pull the antibiotics off of them, give them their withdrawal time, and then send them to market. Without that tool, now we've got these bacterial infections and no way to treat them, because it's too late to vaccinate uh, if they're already there. And so treatment options have become um, very limited when you've got an immune suppressed bird with secondary bacterial infections. Now, any good vaccination program for IBD has to start in the breeders, correct? Correct. So you want to start with a good breeder vaccination program and the key to that is finding the viruses in the field that are causing the problem and matching those antigenic strains with the viruses that you have in your breeder vaccination program. You can vaccinate breeders and have the highest titers in the world, but if it's against the wrong antigenic strain, it's not going to do any good when those broilers hit the farm. And are there particular diagnostics that you recommend right now to try to determine what the best program should be? Diagnostics has been uh, uh, kind of a, uh, changing over the years and, and more recently it's gotten very good uh, at detecting the viruses in the field. So we rely on polymerase chain reaction and sequencing and sequencing has become very cheap. So we can sequence all these viruses now and determine what amino acids are at these special locations where we see the antigenic drift. If we can do that in the field, we have the samples to, to diagnose these, these viruses in the field, then we can use that information to put together a vaccination program for the breeders. Uh, and so I think uh, most farms, uh, I would recommend that they, they follow their flocks by virus detection using polymerase chain reaction and sequencing over time so that they can see how the viruses are changing as they change their breeder flock immunization programs. I think that's very important. Uh, historic data is, is really good for us because we can say, okay, we've seen this virus before and we know this vaccine works against it. Or we haven't ever seen this virus before and it's coming in early in these birds, like at, at you know under 14 days of age, and that's a problem virus. That's one that we need to get into the breeder program right away. 
But still, I would imagine that you know you were indicating that because of the variants, uh, you know some of the commercial vaccines are not keeping pace. Yet, the best-selling vaccine in the poultry industry is a recombinant for IBD, and certainly there's a lot of traditional vaccines that are commercial vaccines that are being sold for IBD as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a situation where they're, they're working very well in some places and then maybe not in some others? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think a lot of the reason why they might work well in some situations and not in others is because of the uh, large range of antigenic types of bursal disease virus that are out there now. Um, we have maybe gotten a lot better at detecting these and, and identifying them in the field, but it seems like there are um, geographically isolated populations of these viruses that are antigenically drifted enough that they are very different than what we might see in another geographic location. So, for example, the viruses we have in Ohio, uh, in the broiler flocks in Ohio, are very different than anything else we see in the U.S. Um, and so the, the viruses we see in, in Arkansas are different than what's in Georgia and California, et cetera. So some of these vaccines can work pretty well against those, and, and other vaccines don't work very well at all. Now, you mentioned the recombinants, and recombinants are used at, at in novo usually uh, and are designed to provide um, uh, immunity in the broilers that's an active immunity. So as the maternal antibodies are declining in these broilers, these recombinant vaccines are designed to boost the broiler's own immune system so that it responds to them. And they do work very well. Uh, in some farms, they don't work quite so well. And we're not quite sure what the difference is in these, but um, they're not the magic bullet. They're not going to cure all your, your problems. So, Well, I know that we've talked a little bit before about rotating vaccines. Uh, does that still seem like a good idea with IBD? just because of these changing variants? If you rotate the vaccines and make an informed decision on rotating those vaccines, that basically you're looking at what's in the field and what vaccine can we now use to best match what we have in the field, then yes, I would say you know, rotating vaccines might be a good way to go. But you don't wanna, you don't wanna uh, stop doing something if it's working. And so if you have a vaccination program in your broiler farm and it's working, stick with it until something changes in that bursal disease virus that, that causes you to start having problems. And that's when you then need to make that informed decision, okay, how are we going to change our vaccination program? Do we need to, to change something in the breeder vaccination program? Do we need to add something to the broiler uh, vaccination program? And, you know, and, and those kinds of decisions will depend on when the virus is infecting the, bro the broilers and what the antigenic type of that virus is. But is there any risk in, in waiting and not being proactive with a rotation? Sure, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of risk in that. Um, and the, the risk is that whatever that virus is now mutated to will catch hold in these farms and just take off because now it doesn't have uh, maternal immunity that's gonna block it or stop it. So yeah, there's, there's a risk involved. And unfortunately, uh, we're always behind the curve on that. And so it's usually we start to see a problem, it gets really bad, and then we react and change the vaccine program and get it under control again. And unfortunately, that's been the cycle. You've been chasing this bug for a long time. Do you think you'll ever get it fig figured out? Probably not. I mean, one of the things we've been doing recently that I'd like to talk about is that over the entire world, we get samples from all over the world. And around the world, we start to see lots of different types of the virus. And in the past, we've, we've called them classic, variant, or very virulent. Those were the three big classifications. And those really don't work when you're starting to look at viruses around the world. There's a lot of differences in these, and we decided that maybe it might be easier for everyone if we start using the genome group type for these things, like they're doing with rheoviruses mm -hmm. now and like they do with uh, another burnavirus that infects fish. And there are basically seven genome groups that we found. There's the big three, classic variant and very virulent are genome groups one, two, and three. But then there are these four other genome groups that don't four match others. anything yeah. that we have as far as vaccines go. And those are uh, not, not only all over the, over the world, but we see many of them here in the U.S. So how do we deal with those now? And, and, and what do we do as far as vaccines go? And that's gonna be a big problem. I think autogenous vaccines have, have helped tremendously, and I think there's more, than we, more that we can do there. Well, it's a complex problem, and it's certainly not going away anytime soon. No, it's not. <laughs> 
We've been talking to Daryl Jackwood. He is a professor at The Ohio State University. Thanks again, Daryl. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me.